uh, May uh, seminar, which is um, focused on the oral health of people with intellectual disabilities and more generally people with disabilities this afternoon. Um, we've got two speakers, um, one from Sydney and one from Melbourne. Um, Nathan Wilson is the first speaker. He's an associate professor in the School of Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Western Sydney. Uh, he's a long time researcher uh, in the area of working with people with intellectual disabilities and has an extensive history of working in the field, in practice and by discipline. He's a, uh, I think they're called uh, learning disability nurses, um, but that name has been superseded over the years, I think. Um, anyway, Nathan's a very experienced researcher and practitioner in this field, and he's gonna talk about his research and his presentation is titled Beyond the Dental Chair, the Role of Caregivers in Promoting Oral Health. So over to you, Nathan. Um, thanks very much, uh, Chris, and uh, hello, everybody. My name is Nathan Wilson, as Chris mentioned. Um, the University of Western Sydney is now called Western Sydney University. They had a, a, a rebranding exercise and so, uh, the, the, the new logos uh, down on the bottom on the right hand side there. And I'll also draw your attention to the logo on the bottom left hand side of the screen. Um, the Australian Centre for the Integration of Oral Health is a brand new um, national collaboration um, in the area of oral health and disability um, research is going to play you know, an important part in that national collaboration. So anyone that has an interest in oral health should be checking out the um, ACO um, website um, to find out a little bit more information about um, the collaboration. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm gonna be focusing on the role of caregivers um, in the provision of oral health. And we'll be talking about um, the research that I've been doing uh, in this space. So um, as Chris mentioned, I've got a clinical background and a, a re more recent research um, background. I guess it was 20 years as a clinician. Um, and I, rather than, as, as Chris mentioned, being a, a learning disability nurse, I, I really consider myself more just a nurse that um, works with people with intellectual disability and, and their families. And even though I'm now a researcher and I have an academic role, I, I still see myself as a nurse um, but a nurse researcher. And much of what I do is still um, focused um, on the lives and the issues that people with disability are facing more so than, you know, for example, basic research or, you know, theoretical research and so on. So on the left-hand side there, um, they're, they're just sort of the broad areas of research focus um, that I um, am, are working on. And on the right-hand side, there's just a, an example of, of some of the past and current projects that um, I've worked on. Um, the, the, the second one there, the role of nurses who work with people with intellectual and developmental disability. Um, that's been something that um, has been a bit of a labor of love over the last you know, six years, particularly. And um, the, the, the role of nurses who are particularly working those with multiple chronic and complex health problems. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that at the end of my presentation and how important the role of nurses who work with those people with multiple chronic and complex health problems are. Um, some of the other stuff, uh, mentoring programs at Men's Sheds for Young um, Adults with Intellectual Disability. And a, a very recent uh, a project I've been working on is looking at uh, reducing psychotropic medication use in adults with intellectual disability and, and challenging behaviours. And similar to the oral health stuff, the, the psychotropic medication stuff is about, you know, educating caregivers about psychotropic medications and educating them about what they can do um, to work um, more effectively with individuals and their families. So basically in a nutshell, um, you know, what do we know about oral health and people with intellectual disability? You know, the, the, the key points from the literature are that their oral health status is very poor. Um, significant problems uh, with, with being independent in the performance of their own um, oral hygiene, uh, a definite lack of oral health literacy and like access to many other health services, there's also many access barriers to oral health 
um, services and, and dental services. And as we know, many people with intellectual disability have multiple chronic and complex comorbidity, heavy reliance on caregivers with few models of effective caregiver training. Um, there was a Cochrane review done in this area a little while ago, and the, the Cochrane review concluded that in terms of the interventions around oral health and intellectual disability, that was very low to low evidence for any of the um, published studies um, in this space. Um, and they, they argued for a combination of, you know, not only a six monthly, you know, check up at the dentist, but, but targeted and individualized effective um, interventions um, were needed. So I first became interested in this area, I guess, working as a nurse and particularly that much of the work that I was doing was with people with, um, you know, multiple disabilities and, and multiple chronic and complex health problems where many of them were nil by mouth, they had peg tubes, many of them had, you know, an, a number of um, deformities in the, the structure of the jaw or the mouth or, um, you know, and significant dental issues. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of my time working as a nurse was spent um, you know, I guess kind of supervising support workers, but also developing oral health care plans um, for many of the clients that we worked with. And also when many of the people would go to hospital for a range of different reasons, actually teaching the nursing staff on the hospital wards how to provide oral health care to this, you know, particularly um, vulnerable cohort. So I've, I've got a long-standing interest um, in oral health, which I guess kind of, you know, led me down um, this research pathway. So all good researchers will start with, you know, doing literature reviews and, you know, small qualitative studies and so on. And so that's what I'm going to take you on now is just a little bit of a journey about what we've been doing as a team um, of researchers. So we've, we've, a number of years ago, we did um, two literature reviews. The first literature review focused on, you know, what are the problems? And the second literature review was focused on what are, the, what are the solutions. And the references for these reviews are at the end of my presentation. Um, so in terms of the problems, I mean, I've summarized it before, and, and, and I'm guessing that many of you will know that, you know, that the, you know, poor oral health, large number of, you know, tooth extractions, more dental caries, fewer dental fillings, gingival inflammation. So that's where the, the gums are particularly inflamed and, and bleed easily and get infected and greater rates of indentialism, which is um, missing um, teeth altogether. Um, less preventive dentistry, poor access to services and also significant anxiety during the provision of oral health care. So that, that was a summary of the problems. Um, and in terms of the solutions, what we found with the literature review that, you know, caregivers, and this is family and paid caregivers play a vital role, um, but then, you know, th there needs to be effective interventions for those caregivers to then, you know, provide that effective care um, to their clients. Um, Although there were a, a small number of toothbrushing interventions, again, there was a lack of certainty about the effect, effectiveness of those toothbrushing interventions. And so that's obviously about teaching people um, who can hold a toothbrush and maybe have milder um, degrees of intellectual disability, how to clean their own teeth. Um, and then for those people with more severe intellectual disability and particularly behavioral problems, you know, the, the literature review suggested that dental treatment under general anesthesia was often both necessary and effective. As, as you would all imagine, the big issue with that is that who, who really wants to be putting themselves at risk of regular general anesthetics um, just to have um, dental treatment? And um, there are many risks that come with having a general anesthetic. And so that's why, you know, if, if we can come up with um, individualized and effective interventions, excuse me, that might reduce the number of anesthetics that some of these people um, need to have across their lifespan, then that's a very, very um, good thing. And also some examples of outreach services um, from other countries um, where the dental service came to the people with um, intellectual disability to provide care. Um, dental care rather than the person with intellectual disability going to, um, you know, the dentist and so on. So they're the two literature reviews that we did and we published them a few years ago. 
Um, now, this is a partnership that I um, worked on with a disability service provider in Victoria, um, an organisation called GenU. And I can't recall their previous name before they changed it to GenU. Um, but they're, they're an old, uh, you know, they've been around for quite a long time. And, and, and also Dental Health Services Victoria. So basically Dental Health Services and GenU developed um, an, an oral health champ, champions program. Um, and that's where a disability support worker agreed to be an oral health champion for one year. And so what we basically did is we wanted to do interviews with some of those champions to get a sense of what their experiences were and to get a sense of what kind of outcomes they feel, um, you know, uh, came from their, their, their time as an oral health champion. So the oral health champion basically went to a classroom-based education sessions with three follow-up sessions across the 12-month period. And the, the follow-up follow sessions were basically for them to all get together and problem solve about you know, what was working, what wasn't working and, and to get tips and so on. Um, so the idea was that they, they would lead practice change through a peer led approach. And so this was a really nice little um, partnership between, you know, a government, a disability service and a researcher to explore these perspectives. So um, what, what um, the interviews um, identified that there was, um, the, 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 the oral health knowledge of the champions did increase um, and they talked about a number of reported benefits to people with intellectual disability. And so, for example, mo most of them, though, were around um, diet changes, you know, where maybe previously they would have had um, cordial, lots of cordial orange juice or soft drinks available in the house. Um, or they would, you know, have cake and biscuits and things like that for snacks. And so then, you know, over a period of time, they were able to progress that to, you know, having water um, for, for drinks and fruit uh, for snacks rather than cakes and biscuits and that kind of thing, you know, for morning tea and afternoon tea and so on. So although they talked about some um, benefits to the people with intellectual disability, most of the things they talked about were actually around um, diet um, changes. The second point there, they, they also talked about, you know, it was actually not easy being a champion and particularly where they were working within settings where, you know, there, there were entrenched routines and practices where people were basically stubborn and, well, we've, all, we've always done it this way, why would we change? You know, there's nothing wrong with the way that we're doing it. And so being a support worker with that kind of um, resistance um, that they found um, very, very difficult. Um, in terms of the workshops, they um, learned that basically oral health was not just about cleaning teeth. And some of them even said that, you know, they, they've changed their oral health practice as a result of being an oral health champion. And that they didn't realize that, you know, you were meant to clean your teeth twice a day and, and so on and so forth. So that, that was quite interesting. Um, but in terms of an, 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 any notable descriptions of outcomes on the actual oral health status of any of the people with intellectual disability, there were, we, we didn't, obviously the study didn't record those outcome measures, but also none of the champions talked about um, anything that ensued from um, their work that they did. So moving on to another study now. So um, I've partnered with Westmead Hospital Special Needs Dentistry Unit. So they ran an education program for carers called Smiles for Life. Um, and that was classroom based with a bit of a hands-on component. Um, they collected some pre-post data to basically look at change in knowledge um, from before the education to after the education. And this, this was similar to the GenU project where we as researchers partnered with them. That is, we provided the money and the resources to do the research. Um, so we ended up with 244 matched pairs. But what was really interesting about this program was that their oral health knowledge decreased after the program. And that was more so in carers who had fewer educational qualifications. And so what we were able to conclude from that was that the content of the Smiles for Life program was actually pitched at too high a level. And so this, this was a program that was um, designed and delivered by health professionals within a mainstream health um, setting. And so many of the um, carers um, 
got confused about some of the messages that they were being given um, from the training. So it was a salient lesson in making sure that when you're doing these, you know, education programs for carers, that you're actually pitching it um, at the right level and not making it too academic or too research-based um, and so on. And so that's that we've um, just submitted a journal article that's under review at the moment um, for that study there. So moving on, this is now a, another study that we've been doing where we've done a national survey of disability support workers across Australia. Um, and I'm just writing up the results now and we hope to submit a paper for publication in the next few weeks. So I'll just give you a bit of a snapshot um, uh, here in terms of some of the key results. And um, although, um, you know, if you look at the first one there, you know, although only 28.5% um, scored incorrectly on that particular item or around the connection between bacteria and poor oral health. Um, that's still a very, very high percentage, in particular when we know that many people with intellectual disability um, uh, are hospitalised for aspiration, pneumonia and so on, and that um, not, all, not all the time, but quite often, um, the saliva that's completely filled and overgrown with bacteria can be one of the causes of um, pneumonia because the, the, the bacteria-filled saliva just, just falls into the um, lung cavity. And then um, in terms of the um, amount of the, the, the frequency of teeth brushing, 63% of carers got that question wrong. And then again, in terms of the link between bacteria and chest infections, 38% of caregivers got that question wrong. Um, so they, they were the knowledge items there. Um, in terms of the barriers, um, we can see here that a large proportion of the support workers agreed that there was a lack of um, guidance and policies for them to, to use uh, in their day-to-day -day practice and, and also that there was a lack of training, adequate training for them. And interestingly, more than 50% of the samples said that they don't have enough skills themselves to provide oral hygiene care for their clients. So support workers are basically saying, I don't have enough skills, I'm not given the right kind of guidance and I'm not given the right kind of training that I need to do my job well. Um, so in a way, when you think about how poor the oral health is of people with intellectual disability, then this is kind of not surprising. Um, and so then if we look at, um, we asked, you know, how many had had any training and only 25% um, had ever received any kind of oral health training um, at all. So potential solutions. So basically, we, you know, we have the issue under the NDIS where we have a, a, a largely, and I'm using the term unregulated, other terms are unlicensed workforce. Um, where un unlike health professionals who have to register every single year with ARPA and we need to make a declaration of continuing professional development and so on, support workers don't have those same requirements um, at all. And they are the large part of the disability workforce in Australia. And there's some data out there from NDS and um, um, elsewhere that, that highlights that it's a highly casualised workforce, that staff turnover is incredibly high and the level of training um, um, is very, very low uh, within the disability support worker population. So our goals as a team of research is, is basically, as I've said, you know, we've, we've scoped the breadth and depth of the problem. We've done surveys and so on looking at knowledge and barriers. And we're moving on to the next stage now, which is basically looking at, you know, designing and testing potential solutions that will be a natural fit with the NDIS landscape. We've got an NHMRC grant application under review at the moment, and that's focused on um, oral health of children. Um, and we're also gonna, gonna be working on a grant to develop and test a system-based um, caregiver intervention. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so this, this is a model, um, this is what I mean by a systems-based model here. Um, and so if we, if, we look up, um, if we look at the diamond in the middle there, at the top of the diamond, there are people with you know, significant and multiple oral health complexity. So they're, they're the most complex people um, in terms of their oral health. And down the bottom part of the diamond, you've got the opposite, which is people with few and fairly straightforward oral health issues. 
And then on the left and the right hand side of the diamond there, you've got people who need um, significant or pervasive um, care and support. And then at the other end, you've got people that need infrequent or minimal um, care and support. And so then the way that I've kind of constructed this is that for those people, if you look up on the top right hand side there where um, I've referred to a multidisciplinary team led by a registered nurse, that's for those people with the most significant and complex oral health problems and pervasive needs for care and support. Um, because they often have, um, you know, multiple morbidities such as neurological disorders, respiratory disorders, gastrointestinal disorders, as well as oral health issues, that um, a registered nurse with expertise in this area is able to pull all of those body systems together in terms of, you know, framing, um, you know, the right kind of approach and context for care and support. And then right down to the other end where you have a support worker led model. So down on the bottom left hand side there, where support workers should be perfectly fine to lead the oral health um, care with input from the multidisciplinary team for people with infrequent um, support needs and very few oral health care issues. So that, that's a bit of a work in progress. And so that's where we're at at the next stage is to basically take this model and to design a, a training program that's flexible enough that um, it, it can be um, useful for any person um, at, at any, uh, within any area of that model that we've designed there. So it can be changed and tweaked um, as, as needed. So basically, in summary, we need to develop interventions to increase the knowledge and improve the practice of caregivers. Um, we need to also develop interventions that will increase the knowledge and practice of people with intellectual disability who can perform oral health self-care. And then there's obviously the need to make sure that we're creating policy and procedure change at a national level around oral health and intellectual disability. Um, it, it's not reasonable that this cohort have got such poor oral health um, when compared to the uh, general population. So that's basically um, it from me. There's a bunch of references there and I can um, share those with anyone that wants them. And there's my email address and there's the website um, for ACO that I encourage anyone to um, have a look at. Thank you. Okay. Um, welcome back to uh, the second presentation for this afternoon's uh, seminar. Um, and I, it's great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Matthew Lim, who holds a whole heap of formal positions. Um, he's, the he's a consultant at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. He's the director of the dental services at the Alfred and president of the Australian and New Zealand Academy of Special Needs Dentistry. And he's also the dentist of Dr. William Smith, who's one of, William Crisp, who's one of our research fellows and comes highly recommended um, as a special needs dentist. Those of you who know William, he has quite complicated um, physical disabilities. Um, so welcome, Matthew, and thank you very much for agreeing to speak this afternoon. Matthew's gonna talk about the other side of the coin, really, um, from the perspective of, of the health system and the dental system about uh, the problematic issues of providing good oral health care for people with disabilities. So over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Chris, and thanks for the invitation to speak this afternoon. Um, is that, as you mentioned, is that, uh, look, I think that the, the presentation that Nathan gave is a really good summary of where things are and where things need to change from that space of the carers and and that perspective of prevention. And what I wanted to speak to, as Chris was saying, is the other side of the coin here today and, and the experience, I guess, that I've had, but um, the, the spaces in which we need to sort of work uh, from the oral health profession side of things. So I've entitled my presentation today, Filling in the Gaps. Um, as, again, as a dentist, gaps are uh, something that I don't particularly like. Um, gaps are created by holes in teeth. Gaps are areas where in between teeth, um, things can get trapped. Um, and all of these things in that dental type setting often underpin um, or insidiously lead to bigger problems. And it's very much the same. It's, it seems very reminiscent of some of the issues that we face as oral health professionals in this particular area. So today in my presentation, what I wanted to discuss with you is some of the findings of my research. 
Um, and in particular, with relation to some of the barriers that, that I, I guess are less spoken about when it comes to addressing the oral health needs of people with disabilities. So a lot of the this, I guess, desire for me to try and fill this gap is, is a research journey, but also a personal one. Um, is, is a lot of the, the, the research in this particular area that I've done echoes a lot of the personal experiences that I had um, and that I went through in transitioning to, I guess, where I am at this point in time. Um, in the early stages of my career is I felt that a lot of the work that I did was to try and fill a gap in the practice that I was working and it was dealing with those with more complex needs that needed that additional time. Um, and a big insecurity for me, um, like many dentists out there, was what knowledge I had and whether I was doing the best by my patients. So that gap in knowledge was really what led me to specialise in this particular area, in this area of special needs dentistry. Um, I really wanted to be a solution for my patients, but then in doing so, realised that I needed to be part of a bigger solution, and that was really what led me to trying to, to look at this PhD. And it seemed very uh, sort of full circle to be able to look at trying to overcome those barriers that, that exist within the oral healthcare system, in particular, the public dental system, um, and, and how we could try and improve access to care for people with different types of special needs. So not just primarily those with disabilities, but also those with complex health needs to understand where the problems lie and how to begin to, to start to address some of those issues. So the, the, the gaps in the system um, are well reported in the literature. And, and, you know, we've had the benefit now of the Royal Commission talking about lot of those gaps as well. And as, as we're quite all of us know is that a lot of that is in relation to access to care for, for those with disabilities. And in particular, um, the, the ability to find oral health professionals who have the adequate level of experience required to manage those with disabilities or who are actually willing to do so. So a lot of my research focused on this and, and you know, this was sort of a big, a big sort of chart of how I sort of navigated looking at the different, the, the issues within specialist healthcare in this area, particularly in dental care, looking at the problems that exist in those systems. Um, so looking at sort of then how we could implement things, um, from my perspective, how I could then contribute back to, to those that were struggling in that same type of situation that I was all those years ago. And so a lot of that was then looking at the supports that could provide by specialists. And something that was very promising in, in what we found was that the role of myself and the other specialists that are in this field, um, despite us being a very limited resource, can have a significant impact on improving the willingness of clinicians to actually treat those with, with, with special needs and, and disabilities. But what I wanted to speak to you, I guess, a little bit about today was to take a step back from that, um, to talk about the barriers that do exist um, and to, to sort of explore those a little bit further um, and how, I guess, we, we need to sort of treat those moving forward. So in this part of my PhD is a lot of what I tried to do was to, in a way, cathartically validate the experience that I had as a general dentist. Um, we, in very much the same way that it's important in the research that Nathan's done in looking at the experience of carers and in the research that we do in the wider disability field and in looking at the lived experience of those with disabilities, my approach was to, to use these type of qualitative methods to understand the experience of those who were trying to look after individuals with disabilities in, in, in the oral health sector. And so what we did is we used semi-structured interviews with oral health professionals across a number of different states and territories. And by doing so is to try and explore what their perceptions were of managing individuals with disabilities, to look at the problems that they face and how they might like to overcome some of those barriers. So these are some of the results that came through and the, the more prominent themes um, that, that sort of emerged from this particular part of our study. Um, it was that there was this general sense, particularly amongst those that had an interest in this area, that it, this really wasn't something for a lot of dentists out there, um, is that it was hard to sort of determine the proportions as such, but most certainly it was a concern that this was an area that a lot of people would not necessarily, I guess, engage with, despite whatever level of training and support that were provided. But more interestingly is that for those who did have an interest is that a lot of them felt very insecure or, or had a significant reluctance in, in wanting to express their interest because what they felt like is that they were going to be lumped with the whole load of having to manage this group of patients. 
and the stress associated with that. And a lot of that stress was to do with a number of different aspects of care, in addition to understanding what these individuals uh, are wanted and how safely that could be provided. So the barriers really that underpinned a lot of these issues were, this, the first one that, that we sort of then see reflected in the literature there is that dentists also felt that they lacked confidence or ability in this area. And that might be partly related to the, the inadequate training that they have, but also this sense of wondering if there was someone out there that could do better than them, um, or worried about the harm that they could be doing to those patients and trying to, to provide that care. But the other side of things was really the lack of support that they felt in this particular area. So, and this was more than just having, you know, access to particular facilities and equipment. It was about a feeling of being unable to provide the level of care that was required for these particular individuals. So these were a number of the, theme, the big themes that came through in terms of their recommendations in particular areas that may be able to provide that additional support. And when we broke it down, it sort of came, a few th key themes came through. The first one was in relation to education and training and the desire for that to be an area that was addressed. Another was the, the desire to really be involved, to, to be able to network with other clinicians working in this area, um, whether within the, not only within the oral health profession, but also the, those outside um, the, of the oral health profession and other areas of healthcare that may be managing those with disabilities. Um, but also looking at how, you know, trying to, to have a sense of being more supported within their work environment. So, you know, these were the key themes that sort of came through and how to address these gaps. And really, you know, when we think about it, when you think about, I guess, a clinician working in healthcare, they're not really that revolutionary when it comes down to it. You would really hope that for the, the vast majority of health professionals out there that you would see is that they would have these types of things to be able to pro provide anyone with the healthcare that they needed. And most certainly, if we look through the findings of the Disability Royal Commission, is that these are part of the themes that sort of come through as well, particularly in the areas of education and training, as well as trying to foster that level of networking collaboration. The question is, though, is that how do we create the supportive work environment for these, these clinicians? Um, I mean, most certainly one aspect of it is probably looking at these, these, these issues more globally. And in addressing education, training and networking communication is that we may partly address that. But what else might there be within that setting that we need to sort of take into account? You know, what is it that, that is within that setting? And particularly, the, the, we need to remember, we're primarily talking about the public dental sector here, is what is it within that setting that makes these individuals feel unsupported? And are these issues, the, the, sort of the, those, those gaps or those insidious barriers that may be underlying some of the issues that exist in, in access to oral health care for people with disabilities? So I guess the key question is, is do we really understand the problem that exists? is that we're getting a bit of an idea now from the, the Royal Commission about the lived experience with people with disabilities. And that echoes very much a lot of what we've seen in the literature in the past. Um, we, we all know the, the issues that exist within the public dental system. Um, you know, in, in, with the election um, here at this point in time is we've, we've heard figures about the number of Victorians on, on the public waiting list. And I think realistically is that a lot of that disguises the experience of people with with disabilities and more complex health needs because they're more likely to be, or there's a disproportionate number of those individuals within these numbers. But also is that um, hidden amongst all of that is the issues within being able to access the care that they need and particularly that specialist, that specialist care. I mean, from looking at some of those fig figures within the dental hospital itself um, that are published is often that sometimes it indicates that, you know, Patients, I think I saw a chart earlier today that was indicating that patients that came off the waiting list for specialist care in special needs dentistry in April of this year, their initial referral went in in 2016. Um, so that indicates to you the, level, the length of time that these individuals are having to wait. So, I mean, beyond that, th this understanding is that are there other things that we don't know? Um, and what are the gaps in our understanding? And the thing that I would challenge you really is that we know very little about what Australians with disability want or need in particular in relation to, to oral health care. Um, in the space of their preferences with health care is that we don't really, we've never really uh, looked from a study point of view at, at what they would like. You know, is it, is it that they want to have, be able to access that care with their general dentist locally? You know, if, if transport and location of the clinic is a barrier, as it has been, has been, um, identified in the clinic, is there a reluctance as a result of that to travel, travel to specialist services? 
And where does that weigh up against the experience of the clinician is, is how does how is that quantified in the experience of someone with a, with a disability? You know, is it that these individuals want to access care within the public sector because of some of the issues that we've discussed in the questions about the, the cost of dental care? Or is it something that they would prefer to, to, to access in the private sector if they actually had the capabilities to do so? And how does that influence, I guess, our advocacy in the areas of funding? But also, what do individuals with disability actually want when it comes to care? Um, part of the discussions that we had um, as a result of Nathan's presentation was so that this desire to, to the, the, this, this overarching idea of trying to reduce restrictive practices. And it's something obviously that I would be supportive of, of as, as a specialist in this area and just trying to minimize that as a restrictive practice. But at the same point in time, my experience as a clinician is, is that often in a lot of these situations is that when people present is that, is that they feel that they need to have that type of support for that care. Um, but in addition is that we have few, we, we don't really have that many modalities to be able to provide. Um, you know, in, in settings like the UK is that we have a much more graded opportunity for different modalities to support people with disabilities, whereas in Victoria in particular, which is a, a different situation to New South Wales and particularly into Westmead and, and the setting that Nathan was talking about, is that here there is a very big divide between, between providing care with no, no sort of, um, I guess, assistance uh, in modality to a little bit in the space of oral sedation and, and, and uh, relative analgesia or nitrous oxide sedation to help support these individuals. And then a giant jump all the way to the other end of the spectrum with GA. So, you know, that is the sort of divide that we have. And we don't really know what these individuals want um, in terms of that space. And, and if we're really reflecting their experiences and their desires in that area. Um, Another sort of key, key sort of confounding factor amongst all of this is, is oral health a priority for these individuals? Um, it may be a bit of a, a sort of a controversial question to, to ask um, in this particular setting and, and rare to come from an oral health professional as such. But when we look at the number of issues that individuals with disabilities have, is that oral health often sits at the bottom and we don't know whether that's necessarily a reflection on the support networks around them and, and you know the, the need for the work that Nathan and his team are doing in terms of trying to improve that whole oral health lit literacy amongst families and carers. Um, because a key component of oral health care is trying to, to address things from a preventive point of view is a lot of these issues are, are managed and, and prevented um, by those basic things that are done at that home level. But in, in, sense when, in a sense is that oral diseases are very much chronic diseases and they need to be dealt with in the same fashion as other chronic diseases in, in, in management of those risk factors over time. The end product is the surgical, the surgical management or the filling or the extraction of, of the tooth itself. But there is a certain degree in which managing that from the point of a surgical point of view or doing a filling on a tooth with a hole in it only is going to have minimal limited benefit if we are unable to prevent that disease from occurring in the future. And so a confronting issue for many oral health professionals working in this sort of environment and trying to feel unsupported is the fact that there is often this conflict in that situation between what they see, what the message may be that they're getting from the individual and the desire of what they'd like to have done, the space of what's being done in terms of their oral care on a day-to-day -day basis, and the presentation that they have and the disease in their mouth. And particularly in the space, I guess, of this, 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 this conflict, and particularly sometimes the, the anecdotal situations that came through my research and my own experience in, in the views of carers that are often um, espoused, I guess, within dental appointments, is that with moves towards value-based healthcare within our healthcare systems, is how is this going to impact on individuals with disabilities that don't advocate for themselves? And will it disadvantage them? You know, it, it, a good example would be is that you know, I often have patients who come in who are on significantly modified diets, mainly because of dysphagia type issues. So they may be on mince diets or, or pureed diets as such. And so the, the, the carers will often, you know, present a point of view of why does it really matter certain aspects of, of their care? You know, do they need to have dentures as such to replace, the, replace missing teeth because they're not necessarily using them? In a value-based healthcare model is we don't actually know what this is going to translate to, but if someone doesn't chew in that sitting, is do they need, do they really need teeth? And as a result, is this going to mean that that this sort of issue of, of, of 
the the significance of of impact of oral health on the, the well being of these individuals is actually exacerbated. But I think that you know another issue is is that we don't really have good mechanisms to actually measure and understanding the oral health needs of uh, Australians with disabilities. There's a lot of what we rely on are sort of convenience or, or cohort studies um, that we have available to us. And this was one small snippet of, of, of my PhD and what we looked at, in particular those who in, were, were at sort of that end of the line of needing the treatment under general anaesthetic for one reason or another. And it shows you the burden of treatment that these individuals need, you know, in that some come to that setting um, and because they haven't been able to be examined, they're found to need nothing, which is, you know, really highlighting that point that Nathan, Nathan made about, you know, the risk associated with general anaesthetic when, when we haven't really taken that preventive or, or at, uh, attempted more of that preventive approach um, at that primary care setting to the complete opposite end of the spectrum where we're seeing individuals come in with significant uh, amounts of disease. Um, and, and you can only imagine, um, you know, the amount of it, the, the significant impact that must have on the well-being and the quality of life of that individual. So in addition to, I guess, understanding and recognising these particular problems, the next issue within the supporting uh, within trying to support clinicians is trying to look at opportunities to try and support the change from the current sort of the, the current situation and encouraging these, these clinicians to do what they're doing. And we've talked a little bit about, you know, the opportunities that exist in this particular area. And there's most certainly, you know, the, the discussion about integration in, in terms of disability into all parts of sort of basic healthcare training, the opportunities for ongoing professional development. But an area that probably isn't discussed that much is the support and incentives to, to embark on the path that I've gone down in terms of specialty training. Um, I'm very fortunate to be in the positions that I am um, because mainly pro probably because of being in the right place at the right time. Um, but opportunities for specialists in our field are relatively limited. And so it's a big, it's a, it's a, a big step for someone to decide to take that leap of faith um, to embark on going down this particular path when there are not necessarily the, the mechanisms in place to support a growth within our specialty. I guess to give you a sense of the numbers is our specialty in Australia has existed now for almost 15 years. And the number of specialists that we have across the whole of Australia is only 25. And probably about five of those are no longer in active practice. So we're probably around the space of 20. If you compare that to the UK, um, that I mean, inherently has a different system to Australia, but had but recognised the specialty after we did here in Australia and New Zealand, is the most recent figures indicated that in terms of working in spe specialists working in the area of special needs dentistry, is that they were at about 300 specialists across the country and equivalent levels to many other sort of specialty streams. So it really does speak to the investment in that particular area and, and what we're trying to do in this particular space and the challenges that we that we face. In, in trying to develop the specialist workforce to have this filter down to that particular primary care level. Most certainly the other aspect of things is the ongoing support that we can provide through networking and communication. And you know, a lot of that is where my research sort of focused and the role that I can play as a specialist to try and support these individuals. But there's also a lot of others that are working in that, that type of area as well in trying to promote this collaboration and communication and some of the resources that exist out there that are being designed and particularly this is one example that's been designed by the inclusion design lab about trying to approach co-design in resources to understanding how to navigate the healthcare system and how and, and supporting communication between relevant health professionals and carers in trying to to foster this idea of, of collaboration into in, in towards improving the oral health in this particular area. Another aspect of things is listening to clinicians is that a lot of the measures that are out, a lot of clinicians are asking for what they would like in terms of support. And part of the, uh, the lack of support that they receive is, is I guess less uh, minimal investment in this particular area. So this is an area that we kind of need to look at further. But in terms of, you know, I, I guess other support, is that it would be remiss of me to not sort of discuss the funding opportunities that exist in this particular area. Is that particularly for, it is, I would have to be the least person that would need to sort of just to explain to a family or an individual with, with a disability is the lack of support that they really have from the avenue of their oral health. You know, is that we have, 
an oral healthcare system here in Australia in which there is not really much government support whatsoever is that we have no Medicare rebates for it whatsoever. And then on the opposite side of things is we have, as Nathan sort of pointed out, absolutely no NDI supports. And, and that includes not only sort of the approach to the actual, the, the, the addition, meeting the additional needs of those with disabilities and supporting that from a prevention point of view, from, the, from, from a dental professional perspective, but also the challenges that often exist in trying to, to find, to engage and, and, and advocate for additional supports, even at that prevention level at home. And so really, you know, if we're thinking about the argument that's often put out there that the NDIS won't you know, fund other, uh, won't fund the areas of healthcare where there is sort of other funding uh, dedicated to this, to, to, to these particular um, health systems is we need to remember is that even within the public dental system is that there is no direct funding that is attributed to people with disabilities. We often see avenues in which there is additional fund, there are additional funding blocks you know, dedicated towards addressing the needs of kids. And we've seen that, you know, with the, with the, uh, the smile squad vans that, you know, uh, that, that uh, the Andrews government has put in. We see it in a number of different targeted areas. But there has, at, at this point in time, there is no direct funding within the dental system for people with disabilities and addressing their needs. So this comes back to sort of this issue of, of trying to look at, I'm trying to, uh, because we don't understand what individuals with disabilities necessarily want in terms of their actual dental care itself, um, is that we don't know where the funding needs to go. Does it need to go towards trying to, to help them access the, the, the private dental system? And will that relieve some of the pressures that they have with access to care? Or do we need, if the preference is for, for, for individuals to be treated within the public dental system, is should then we, can we be lobbying for that money to be really targeted towards services that actually can meet their needs and providing that support to clinicians in those settings? Because that really is the other side of the coin there is that, the, the, the clinicians that are at the coalface who are trying to provide this care to these individuals are at the behest of basically activity-based funding. And in a lot of situations is that funding is almost a discouragement for them to be able to do so because of the productivity measures that are put in place, which is why we're starting to develop this, this, this issue of seeing these, these patients being transferred from that primary care setting where they really should be treated to these specialist areas where there are significant wait lists because of the limited specialist workforce and the limited, the limited resources within that area. So I guess this comes back to, to you know, trying to look at what, what are we trying to achieve between, within the oral health profession in this particular area? And what really is equity in, in this particular space? You know, equity when it comes down to oral health care is ensuring that people with disabilities are attaining the same level of oral health as everyone else. And that in doing so is that they're able to access the care that really supports their needs in this particular spot. But when we think about the, is that dentistry has taken a very unique approach to this in identifying and developing a specialty dedicated to the more complex needs of these individuals. But what needs to sort of be considered is the balance in this particular situation of, of highlighting the additional needs of, of those with disabilities against the idea of trying to normalize the idea of disability as a spectrum of ability and, and, and the expectations from that side of things. Because what the general feeling is at this point in time, and maybe particularly sort of controversial to sort of think about, is that to a certain degree, maybe in highlighting the disability and trying to promote the, this access to specialized healthcare and a number of these other insidious barriers that exist is that we're actually developing another level of dis discrimination as such in siloing these particular into a particular health service where it's never going to be adequately resourced because of, because of uh, workforce, because of resourcing, because of just capabilities to be able to actually address their needs. So really what is the solution when it comes down to filling the gap? The reality is, is that even though we've identified oral health professionals as a particular big proportion of this gap that exists in addressing the oral health needs of these individuals is that it really isn't a single gap as such, um, is that it may be a primary barrier that's there in terms of having clinicians with the adequate skills, um, knowledge and the willingness to treat disabilities, but the, the basis behind it is much more factorial. Um, and, and a lot of that multifactorial nature comes back to the issues of the supportive environment that these, that these clinicians lack in which they're working. 
And part of that is the fact that we don't have the research to really understand and recognize the problems that exist within our healthcare setting, as well as the needs of people with disabilities in this area. Um, as was sort of indicated by some of those findings from the Disability Royal Commission and the National Roadmap in that particular area, but also that there really sort of uh, is a significant lack in opportunities to try and support this change. So in the current environment is basically underlying sort of this, this, this initial issue of clinicians not being willing to do so is actually an environment in which they're being disincentivized to, to actually treat these individuals because of the lack of support, a backlog then that specialist services. And at a, at a professional level, I guess the issue that it's that the, the dental profession to a certain degree is being scapegoated for something that is probably beyond their control to a certain degree. I think that this sort of brings us back to, you know, very much where sort of Nathan started his presentation and recognizing that as much as oral health is partly a dental issue, that it's much more beyond that is that we really need to start thinking about it from a complete body point of view, really realizing that oral health is no longer a set of dentures that can be taken out and put in a cup and separated from the rest of the body. That in fact, it is that we have the evidence to demonstrate how much of an integral part of general health it is, but how much of an impact it has on the quality of life of Australians with, with, with disabilities. So in thinking about coming back to trying to fill these gaps, when it comes to addressing the oral health of people with disabilities, Certainly one solution is what my PhD talked about in the role that I and other specialists can play in supporting these clinicians. And it is something that from that perspective is something relatively sort of uh, not particularly resource intensive in the way that we can provide that support. But the challenge that I would put to you, I um, mean, all the areas that you work, um, you know, whether it's in research or advocacy or whether it's in different aspects of clinical practice, is to consider where you can help close that gaps in relation to the perceptions towards oral health. Um, because I think that that moving forward and that collaboration, that partnership with the oral health profession is really going to be key to helping Australians with disabilities really overcome what is an essentially a preventable condition um, and, and it's quite significant contributed to their quality of life. So thank you again for the chance to talk. These are sort of my contact details here um, and I'm more, always more than happy for you to reach out for any of those. Um, but otherwise, um, is I'll finish up and then open the floor to any particular questions. Thank you so much, Matthew. I mean, there's a huge amount there in what you've said. It's, it, there's a lot to digest, I think, and a really sophisticated sort of argument backed up by some very strong research.